Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Seattle Building and Closure Council uh, November meeting. Um, we'll get started here shortly as people are rolling in. As you likely know, Seattle Building Closure Council, CBEC, is a nonprofit um, that is here to improve design and construction of the building enclosure. Um, and uh, we do that um, with the help of our board members. Uh, my name is Nathan Sini. I'm the current president. Amelia Davis with Northwest Partners is our secretary. Jeff Didion from OAC is our treasurer. Uh, Amanda Pro with Morrison Hirschfield is our education chair. Um, if you have ideas for future presentations or see a good presentation somewhere and you'd recommend it for CBEC, please reach out to Amanda. Uh, Cliff Marvin is our membership chair. Hillary Roy um, does our venue coordination and we get back into actual venues. Uh, Joel Thornburg uh, is our sponsorship coordinator. If you're interested in sponsoring a future CBEC meeting, please reach out to Joel. Bill Thordarson does our student outreach. Grace Wong does communications. Uh, Jeremy DeWitt is our website chair. Penny Short is our board administrator. Uh, Phil Martinson uh, is our Spokane representative. Um, so we're bringing Spokane and uh, Seattle together into one uh, Beck chapter. Uh, and then Rob Bechtel is our immediate past president. Uh, we are having our first in-person event, um, sort of happy hour holiday party on December 16th at the East Lake Bar and Grill. Um, so we hope you are able to join us. Um, it's going to be a little lower key, no white elephant, no raffle, um, but just kind of get together and see some faces um, that we haven't seen in a while. And then our January meeting uh, will be January 20th. Um, I think we're still pinning down a topic for that. Um, but we have a lot of interesting topics coming up where we are looking to bring uh, Richard Green back um, to talk about um, structural glass. Uh, I know Amanda is talking to the woman who runs uh, the Building Science Fight Club Instagram page, uh, <laughs> which is um, a fun one. And uh, I'm hoping to bring her in in the spring as well. Uh, we have extended the deadline uh, for applications to our research grants to uh, December 3rd. Um, so if you have a grant idea, please get us your proposal in. Um, there are, um, we just wanted to get a few more applications so that we have some material to review <laughs> and uh, help out. Uh, CSI is also having their holiday party. Um, on 12.9, um, which I believe is a virtual holiday party for them. Also coming up on December 3rd is the Facades Plus Seattle put on by the Architects newspaper um, at the Motif Hotel. Um, and I think that looks to be a great event. Um, we've got some uh, Morrison Hirschfield speakers lined up for that, which has been fun. Uh, our sponsor is uh, Lee Jenkerson with West Coat. Um, and Joel, I think you're going to walk us through these slides. I'm going to do my best. Uh, right. Lee is uh, flying across the country right now or in an airport somewhere and and can't join us right now. So uh, West Coat uh, offers uh, several different lines. The one that uh, most of us use the most is, is going to be their waterproofing lines. Um, but they do have uh, specialty industrial coatings for, you know, like garages and, and uh, shops and hangers, uh, as well as uh, just really nice decorative uh, floor finishes for interiors and, and textured stuff as well. So uh, if you're in the market for any of that stuff and you would give uh, Lee Jankerson a call, his, uh, his contact information, I believe, was on the first slide. Um, and it's on the last slide and, and he'll, he'll help you out. He's, he's very responsive, uh, and, and usually gets back to everybody in a timely manner. So, 
uh, we thank Westcote for uh, their sponsorship today and, and wish Lee could have been with us. Well, thanks, Joel. Much appreciated. Um, so our topic today um, is based on a paper uh, from Stefan Hoffman, Morrison Hirschfield, a burning question, fire testing of a window wall system with spray foam insulation. Uh, Stefan is um, a principal here at Morrison Hirschfield with I think 26 years of experience. Um, and he leads our uh, facade engineering group, um, which combines kind of conceptual design of cladding and glazing systems um, from, from early in the design process. Um, and then Stefan, I will let you take it over from here. Thank you, Nathan. Just uh, give me a minute. I'll share a screen and uh, get the, the uh, presentation up. Okay, so you should be able to see my screen and we'll get you started. So I'm happy to kind of join here today to present here on a fire test that we did on a window wall spandrel assembly that was <coughs> installed with an interior layer of spray foam insulation. Um, I'll start by acknowledging the contribution from my two colleagues, Dana Scherf, our Director of Code and Life Safety, and uh, David Kyle, our Director of uh, Building Science in our Ottawa office. This was for their project in uh, Halifax for a residential high rise using a window wall system. So I'll start by saying, you know, as these uh, um, test methodologies, S34 and its equivalent here in the US and FPA 285 are very assembly specific, that this was for a window wall unitized glazing systems. You know, many of you are familiar with the kind of unitized window wall systems. Uh, the one that we tested comes from a Canadian manufacturer. It's based on a kind of residential style window extrusion that spans floor to floor and sits on the slab edge. So you have the typical window extrusion center glaze with a thermal break between the inner and outer half of the aluminum frame, an exterior glazing leg, an interior glaze IGU, usually into a deflection header at the underside of the slab. You see a slab bypass. The system here is based on a slab bypass system, not a slab band cover installed after the fact. So you see here that the exterior leg of the aluminum frame is extended past the slab to provide that integral slab cover that's typical of Canadian window wall. So just a little bit about that system as I know that maybe some of you are not as familiar with that system. So I'll start out by saying, you know, wh why would we do this? Why would we take a perfectly good window wall and subject it to a fire test, right? Well, ultimately it it's about thermal performance, right? So in a typical assembly, as you see here on the left with your insulated metal back band for the opaque elements in the window wall assembly, have a limit on how well they perform. So increasingly we're looking at ways to improve that thermal performance. And currently in the industry that's usually done by adding interior insulation. Now, there are a number of pitfalls there. And you see here on the right, the use of the spray foam that was the methodology that we chose for this project. And that kind of triggered the testing that I'm going to present here today. So you can see that once the window wall was installed, we built up our interior stud wall and then sprayed the back pan with a polyurethane foam, typically about kind of two inches of spray foam. Uh, so in a quick section here, you see that we have our typical window wall, either a metal panel or a spandrel glass. The <clears throat> one I'll present here today was based on a metal panel for the spandrel. The Frame is insulated with mineral wool in between the framing elements. And then we have a seal metal back pan on the interior face. And then we do this layer of spray foam insulation. Why are we doing spray foam? We choose spray foam because it 
adheres to the surface and conforms to the irregularities of the surface of the window wall system. You can see the ins and out at each of the vertical and framing members. If I were trying to do this in board insulation, it'd be very hard to kind of achieve that continuous layer of insulation. Without it, the potential is that air can circulate around this interior insulation, come into contact with a colder frame and create potential for condensation. The spray foam is very good in that aspect in that it is airtight, vapor tight when installed in intimate contact with the surfaces and conforms to all the irregularities. So that's why we were going with the spray foam. Why insulate inboard of the window wall? Well, you know, ultimately it's a question of thermal performance. So as you see here from two sets of data from the thermal bridging guide, without the spray foam, you can see that we only have about an R7 when we have about, you know, <clears throat> an R12 mineral wool in the back pan. If I add the two inches of spray foam, now I'm kind of closer to almost an R10. And though that's still short of the prescriptive requirements in the code for opaque wall assembly, it is a significant improving going from R7 to R10 closes that gap a little bit more. Why am I getting so little out of that R12 that I'm putting on the inside? It's the challenge of the unitized glazing system that any insulation that I put on the interior face can be circumvented by the continuous vertical aluminum mullions that run from the vision area through the insulated spandrel panel. And so that can create some challenges there. This increasingly is relevant for us here in Seattle because the new Washington state code and its Seattle equivalent, the Seattle Energy Code of 2018, have instituted a backstop on the UA calculations that are <clears throat> done as part of the total building performance path. And so right now, in the past, you were able to trade off efficiencies from your mechanical and electrical systems and kind of offset a shortfall in your enclosure. However, now we're being told that, you know, prescriptively under these codes, when you're doing whole building <laughs> energy modeling, you have to limit the shortfall of your enclosure to 10% of the baseline building. And if you're doing the target performance path, that 10% goes away and you have to have something that's at least as good as your proposed buildings. So increasingly, especially when it comes to high rise projects, if you're looking at kind of meeting that UA requirement, you're going to have to do something at your window to, <clears throat> Uh, opaque wall assembly interface and spray foam is one of those measures. So why do we care? Uh, obviously it's driven by energy code compliance and of course if you're also looking at sustainability standards like LEEDS that requires for achieving certain energy points under the atmospheric credits you need to be able to exceed code. And all of that kind of drives more energy efficiencies, you know, operating and maintenance costs also playing into that. So today, you know, our agenda will talk a little bit about what is the risk of fire spread in the exterior walls? What does the code have to say about it? What is the requirement of the S-134 test and how it compares to its American equivalent, the NFPA 285? We'll then talk about the setup for this test and the observation of the test. We'll then take a dive into the results of the test and the disassembly of the mockup. And we'll close with some applications and further limitations. So before I start, uh, we'll come back to this agenda slide at each section and I'll take the questions at that point. Any questions at this point, uh, Nathan? Nope, no questions yet. Okay, excellent. So why do we care about exterior fire spread in the wall assemblies? Well, you know, we've all seen kind of what happens when we don't pay attention to that or when the requirements are not met. Grenfell Tower really brought this to the fore in recent years. 
we had an older building that was refurbished and it turned out to some laps that the material that was used on the exterior of the building did not meet the requirement for fire safety. And a fire that broke out from one of the units was able to spread on the exterior of this building. And in the end, you know, we had 79 people killed as a result of this. So it just drives home why the code puts that emphasis on limitations of fire spreads on the exterior. Grenfell was by no means an isolated uh, incident. We've seen throughout the world various instances in which fires have been able to spread vertically on the exterior of the buildings. And these have led to losses and the challenge of firefighting at heights limits how these, build, these fires can be mitigated. And so codes are increasingly stringent on trying to mitigate that risk. It's not just a issue overseas. You know, this is a fire that happened back in 2014 in Victoria. And so you see here in this residential high rise, fire that started in the unit breaks the glass and comes out on the face of the building. In this case here, this is a concrete building. So fire was not able to spread, but you can see here in this picture, kind of the intensity of the flame that can be generated by these fires on the inside of the suite and how they can pose a significant risk to igniting potentially combustible elements in our wall assemblies. So when we look at vertical fire spread within buildings, what we're kind of focused on is the heat of the fire breaking the glass, allowing the flames from the interior of the unit to leap up through the opening and expose the exterior wall to significant heat and potentially ignite any combustible components and from there make its way further up the building as it continues to spread. So the presentation here today talks about the risk from the exterior perspective, not from the interior. There's separate requirements and I won't cover these about the protection of the spray foam within the stud cavity from the interior fire. This is about the potential on the exterior. In most cases, when we're looking at this, we're usually looking at it in a cladding assembly where we have a veneer with perhaps a backup of insulation on either a steel stud or backup wall. That's generally the basis for the S134 and its US equivalent in FBA 285. Here in this case, what we have is that the cladding really is a unitized glazing system and is the risk for the fire to come out of this opening having broken through the glass to generate enough heat on the surface of our glazing system to ignite potentially combustible components that are within the system. So we're not concerned here about igniting the spray foam from the interior, but whether there's a potential for the fire to spread through the window wall system and potentially ignite the spray foam applied on the interior face of the back bands. There's also requirements for spread horizontally, where in close proximity to adjacent buildings, potential for flames to generate enough heat to potentially ignite a nearby building. So there's additional requirements. I won't go into these in depth. I'm just gonna focus on flame spread on the building itself. So when it comes to exterior frame spread, it can be a number of ignition sources. Usually it's the projecting flames that break out of the units. However, there's potential for fire starting at the base of the building from exterior vehicle, you know, barbecues on balconies are kind of another source of potential things that could create a fire and exposes the exterior to significant heat and potential combustion. The fire spreads by preheating the materials about the fire and kind of getting them to their ignition point. The limitation on firefighting at height is a significant challenge in mitigating that risk and therefore the driver for some strict requirements on the combustibility of components on the exterior of the building. 
And of course, as I've talked, you know, combustible cladding and insulation can contribute to that risk. So I'll go into a little bit on how the code addresses this next, but I'll pause here to see if there's any questions. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about what the code says. And um, I'll apologize here, given the short notice in this presentation, I didn't have a chance to pull in the references to the US code. So I'll just talk generically about some of the root requirements of building codes when it comes to exterior fire spread. So when we have you know, a non-combustible building, the root requirement in the code is that building or part of the building that's required to be a non-combustible construction shall be built with non-combustible material. Kind of straightforward requirement, right? However, there are a number of exceptions, right? And without these exceptions, it, it would be impractical to build almost anything. So really when we'll delve into is how are these kind of exceptions addressed? And when it comes to combustible components, the articles and titles within the various code can vary slightly, but the fundamental intent is the same. It's these exceptions are there to exempt certain combustible material if certain conditions are met, usually on the basis that the materials are deemed to insignificantly contribute to fire growth and spread. So when we look at these combustible components, again, the root provision of the various codes here in North America tend to be that a combustible component is permitted on a building required to be of non-combustible construction, usually if it's of limited height or if the building is sprinklered throughout and the building meets the requirements of certain standards for fire spread. In Canada, it's the CAN S-134, its US equivalent is the NFPA 285. Or in some cases, the code may provide exceptions for certain types of cladding that are deemed to provide sufficient <coughs> protection to flame spread for the elements that are in board of it, typically masonry or concrete. So that's a shortened version of what the code has to say. Any questions there? Okay. We'll go over the nature of the S-134 test. And we'll talk a little bit on how it contrasts to the NFPA 2D5. And then we'll go into the setup for this test and some of the challenges there is in testing a unitized glazing system to this standard. So the S-134 is essentially meant to create a internal fire chamber with an opening through a non-combustible wall, usually a concrete shear wall or a CMU block wall, and then <clears throat> allowing this fire to come out of the opening and expose our enclosure system to the flames and the heat of the fire. And <clears throat> we're looking to create kind of a prescribed amount of heat and what we're doing is then measuring the flame spread up the face of the facade and the temperature differential across the various materials. So the S134, the standard method for fire test of exterior wall assemblies in Canada is there to evaluate fire spread over the exterior surface. It measures the heat flow from the fire plume on the exterior surface of the facade and the frame spread within the wall assemblies. What it does not address is the window framing details. There's you know, no requirements to have a window in the opening. And the performance, as I said, is not meant to address fire risk from the interior. So it's not about flame spread through the interior uh, assembly or stud wall, but strictly from the exterior exposure to the fire. The standard seeks to create a standardized heat flux on the exterior wall of 
point of 27 kilowatts per meter square at 1.5 meter above the openings and of 45 kilowatts per meter square at half a meter above the opening. <clears throat> the flame that's generated in the fire chamber is kind of ramped up for a five minute period is at full flow for a 15 minute period and then decrease back down to zero over a five minute ramp down period. This is meant to represent approximately a six megawatt fire. This is believed to represent the credible worst case event for a fire that would break out to the exterior face of the enclosure. The pass fail criteria for the S134 is that the measured heat flux at 3.5 meter above the opening must be no more than 35 kilowatts per meter squared. The flame height as measured on the exterior facade must be no more than five meter above the opening. And although this is not specifically in the standard, it is frequently added in specification that there should be no flaming on the facade after one hour past the end of the testing. There are thermal couples placed every 0.5 meter on the face of the wall, as well as at discrete layers within the wall typically here at the face of the insulation, as well as at the front of the wall. There are also three heat flow transducers meant to measure the heat flux at that 3.5 meter above the horizontal opening. Lastly, you know, cameras are required to kind of measure the height of the flame spread. There are also some requirements about how the mock-up has to be configured. The horizontal joints have to be provided at a minimum of three meters above the opening. So whatever horizontal break occurs in the system, in our case here with the window wall system, we're talking about the deflection header at the top of the window wall panel, has to be located within three meters of the top of the opening. In addition, vertical joints in the system have to extend from the window opening to that horizontal joint. There is a note in the appendix to the 2013 edition of this standard. It says that the most severe exposure is in the central region of the test assembly, right above the opening. And therefore, the vertical joint should be located at or near the vertical center of the opening. We'll talk a little bit how this was challenging with the window wall configuration. Of course, this is a Canadian standard, so there's not a direct application to uh, our practice here in the US. And I'll go through how these standards differentiate. First, the size of the required mock-up is different. In the Canadian standard, it's a three-story test, six meters wide by 10 meters high. The NFPA is a two-story test with stacked rooms, so a little bit smaller in size. The window opening is also bigger in the Canadian standards, 2.5 meters wide by 1.4 meters tall, whereas the NFPA requires a 1.98 meter wide by 0.76 meter tall opening. The setup of the burner in the fire chamber is also different. In the Canadian standard, they're distributed symmetrically, no higher than halfway between the floor and the sill of the window. In the NFPA, one is located centrally within the lower test room, approximately 0.8 meters from the floor, and the second near the top edge of the window. The duration is different as well. In the Canadian standard, as I mentioned, you have a five minute ramp up period, a steady burn for 15 minutes, and then a five minute ramp down. In the NFPA, the gas flow rate is incrementally increased in five minute intervals for a total of 30 minute duration of the test. The pass fail criteria is also different. As I mentioned, the Canadian standard requires that the flame spread be no more than five meters above the opening and that the heat flux be no more than 35 kilowatts per meter squared 
at 3.5 meters above the opening. The NFPA also measures the flaming, the height of the flame, but it's limited to 3.05 meter above the opening. And the temperature rise at different points in the assembly is the criteria for the pass fail. So given these variations, it, it's not possible to directly compare the results of the two tests. However, it is reasonable that similar trends can be observed between the two tests, especially with respect to flame spread on the exterior surface. When it came to doing this test, there were many challenges in adapting this test to a unitized glazing system. The configuration of the panel was one of the more challenging ones in terms of aligning it with the restrictions that we have for the panels. We also had to replicate the slab edge detail uh, and doing that in the kind of test uh, wall was difficult. We'll go over some of those challenge. The attachment of the panels without access from the interior is also another challenge we had to overcome. Uh, those of you familiar with window wall know that it's installed from the slab edge. In this case, however, we couldn't do this because the firewall is in the way. Likewise, the spray foam application is usually done from the backside of the system. And again, here with the fire test wall in place, we had no access to the backside of the panels once they were erected. So we'll go through the various steps we needed to take to kind of adapt the test protocol for a window wall system. First, we had to look at how to configure the panels. So the window opening that's prescribed is, is larger than the window opening that you would have in a typical window system. So at the base of the building, we had two full height panels on either side of the opening, a default panel below the window opening. And of course, as I mentioned, there's no framing within the center of the opening. If we had really you know, done a test that was more representative of a window wall, we may have had kind of a system where we would have mirrored the panels above. But since the fire spread is really measured above this opening, the configuration at grade was not considered to be a significant impact on the results. We then had to look at the configuration. So we needed to provide a horizontal joint no more than three meters above the opening of our window system. So we ended up kind of, you know, doing kind of that height, the maximum height there for that horizontal joint, which kind of correlates to about a three meter opening in our three meter height in our panels. We then had to configure the panels. And here we chose to do three panels uh, to represent kind of a more typical span in the window wall system. That means that our vertical joint uh, could not fall right at the vertical, <coughs> right at the middle of the window opening. Uh, so it may not have seen the maximum heat flow generated at the center. However, you know, we're really looking to see if we could really ignite the foam on the backside. And so having the spandrel panel right at center probably gave us the best interface conditions. And the verticals has its own challenges. Well, I'll talk in a few minutes that were more severe in its exposure to the flames. And then above this, we just had you know, one last panel that spanned the remainder of the height for this kind of 10 meter tall test wall. The next challenge for those of you who are familiar with the installation of window wall is that the window wall sits on the slab edge projecting kind of outward with a slab band cover. However, the challenge here is that I'm mounting this to a smooth fire test wall, a little bit like when we have to install up against a shear wall, like at an elevator core. So what we had to do was come with a different means of mounting this. We initially wanted to just cast a concrete core ball on the fire test wall, but the lab would not allow us to kind of drill into 
their test wall. So we had to come up with a, a better way of doing this. So we ended up doing a series of angles as is typically done in a shear wall installation that supports the window wall. So one angle at the top of the slab to allow the window wall to rest and take gravity loads back to the shear wall. And then a second angle at the underside of what would have been the slab to attach the deflection anchors back to the backup wall. We were concerned, however, in doing this, that the space, the void left by what would have been the slab would have created a condition that doesn't really replicate the conditions in the field. So we ended up using a block of mineral wool insulation to simulate the non-combustible nature of the concrete projections so that we had a more representative nature of this assembly. So here on the left, you see what we ended up in terms of a detail at the opening in the fire test wall. So you have the angle that supports the window wall, the block of mineral wool that's meant to replicate the slab, the angle above that supports the window wall system. There's a ceramic fiber insulation that lines the fire chamber. It extended out to the deflection header on the window wall. Uh, so this was installed to replicate kind of the potential for flame spread past this into the cavity at the slab bypass. But there was no framing, you know, per the standard, the window does not usually get framed into the opening. Uh, so at the three meter height, this was our horizontal joint, typical construction with the deflection header at the top of the window wall panel, the spray foam insulation behind the strap anchor that's connected to our angle the block of mineral insulation that represents our slab edge on this assembly, and then another angle above it to support the window wall panel. Here are a couple of pictures from the assembly. So you see here on the left-hand side, you see the angle that's installed at the head. That's where the deflection uh, straps are kind of secured. Above it, the mineral wool insulation installed to replicate the slab bypass, the slab band. And then the panels installed above it, you don't see the angle in this uh, picture, but this window wall panel above on the right rests on an angle that's mounted to the firewall above the block of mineral insulation we're using as a slab edge. The next challenge was the insulation. Um, the spray foam is usually applied to the back of the window wall once the panels are erected and forms a continuous layer across the panels. However, with the firewall that you see here on the right, there is no access once the panels are installed for us to install the spray foam insulation. So we had to spray the insulation on the panels before they were erected. This created a significant difference in that we now have an air gap, you know, a joint in the spray foam at each vertical in the panel. And this represents an increased risk of flames being able to penetrate the system and ignite the foam. So we felt that this was a more stringent criteria for the test uh, because in a typical installation, there would be no gap in the spray foam insulation on these vertical moments. And we felt that more than offset the fact that the vertical joint that you see here was not directly in line with the center of the opening. So here you see the fire chamber with the ceramic insulation installed on the interior. All the panel has now been erected. You can see kind of the typical closures that's been installed at the edge of the panel, the deflection header above, the angle supporting uh, the panels on either side, and we're ready to go. Any questions before we go into the actual testing of the panels? We did have one question from uh, Dan Sherber. 
I said, given the differences between the S134 and the NFBA 285, is NFBA 285 accepted in Canada or is a new engineering judgment required? Uh, an NFBA 285 is not accepted as an equivalent to the S134 in Canada, although it has been used as the basis of writing an engineering judgment. So if you have an NFBA 285, a engineer can write an engineering judgment on the basis of that to say that having reviewed the performance under the NFPA 285, you know, I believe from my engineering opinion that it would pass the requirements of the S134. Given the variations, is, is one or the other more difficult to pass typically? You know, it depends on the nature of the system. You know, uh, both of them have a flame spread criteria and, and there they're well aligned. Uh, one measures temperature differential and one measures the intensity of the heat. Uh, you know, so one is, is kind of really the exposure at the surface. The other measures the temperature across the assembly at different points. Um, so from a flame spread, very similar. The temperature can be a little bit tricky, right? Because with the Canadian standard, you're measuring the intensity of the fire at the surface. And if that passes, you're saying, well, the temperature differential within the wall is not an issue if you've also met the flame spread requirement. However, you could meet the flame spread requirement in the NFPA 285, but fail if the heat generated on the exterior creates a sufficient rise in temperature within the assembly. Great, thank you. Okay. So next slide is a little video. Uh, we, we tried it out before, but uh, you know, Murphy's Law says that uh, sometimes we were challenged. So here goes, we'll see if it works. This is uh, the start of the test. Uh, we're in the kind of five minute ramp up period. It just gives you uh, you know, a sense of it. So as I said, everything's installed, you know, time to pull out the 10 foot pole and the bag of marshmallows. I'll mention that, uh, you know, we're sitting here in a test chamber on the other side of the unit. So we're, we are kind of sheltered from uh, the uh, flames and any potential uh, kind of failure of the system. So you can see that as the burners ramp up, the flames exit the fire chamber and start lapping up the exterior face of the wall. You can see the kind of smoke and you can see the flames trying to kind of line up, up the metal panels, kind of heating this. You can get a sense a little bit from that light in the background that you know there's quite a bit of smoke that's starting to build out in this chamber. The you know, exhaust fans will kick in here shortly to kind of start evacuating this, but you'll see that as we progress on my next set of pictures, that the visibility gets lower and lower as more and more smoke builds into this chamber. So here we are kind of ready for our tests. Um, <clears throat> this little device up front here is there to measure wind speed to make sure that that there's not kind of, you know, deleterious kind of airflow that would create more of a fire split potential. So here we are, we're just kind of igniting the uh, burners inside the chamber. Uh, here we are, kind of you start to see the flames starting to rise up and starting to exit. You see already a little bit of soot on the panels. Here we're fully engaged and the flame spread is kind of starting to come up the vertical face of the wall. We're now in the 15 minute kind of steady burn with the flames kind of lapping up. You can see how much visibility has dropped already. This is the point at which the fans and the exhaust start to kick in. So here we are within the 15 minute spread, fully engaged in, the, and in this picture here. You can see that at about seven minutes into the full burn period, we can start to see fire at the vertical joint. Uh, and so what's happening here is that the flame has managed to come into the vertical chase and is igniting the polyamide thermal break. 
by the end of the 15 minute test, you can see the deflection header has melted and fallen to the floor. We also have some debris from the metal panels above that also have melted and fallen to the floor of the test lab. You can see that I've also have the similar flaring on the other vertical joint on the right hand side. Again, indication that I, you know, there's, there's something burning within the mullion. And close up here shows again that flaming of the at the vertical mullion. And this was really where the risk was for the system. Could the fire propagate through the vertical, burn out the thermal break and the gasketing, and expose the spray foam on the backside? Now we're in the last five minutes, the ramp down. So you can see that kind of the fire has been kind of pulled back and now the flames are no longer exiting. We can see that the joint on the right has already self extinguished, but the one on the left, there's still some burning on the face of the system at that vertical mullion. Here we are just at the end of the five minute ramp down, the flames have been shut off in the chamber. And you can see, you know, right now it looks like both of them are extinguished, but in fact, they continued to burn for a period after the flames were turned off within the chamber. So here we are, um, you know, five minutes after the end of the test, the fans have completely exhausted the, uh, <clears throat> the smoke and we can see the results of the test. So we can see that the metal panel directly above has melted exposing the mineral wool insulation within the back pan. And see that the panel above has some surface damage, but the metal panel itself has remained unbreached. We can see the flaming in that vertical mullion at the base of the mullion still going on. Any questions about what we've seen here before we talk a little bit about the disassembly of the system and the final results. More questions yet? Okay, let's go into the results then. So we came to the analysis, you know, <clears throat> we were able to see that as expected, the flames coming out of the opening in the firewall generated enough heat to melt the exterior aluminum panel. And this exposed the mineral wool insulation within the back pan to the flames. The flames were able to penetrate the panel and expose the framing on either side. The flames continued to spread up and we saw some significant damage on the panel above in terms of distortion but no failure of, no, no breach, I should say, of the panel system. The flames self-extinguished within the hour. Uh, so from that perspective, everything looked good. We then proceeded to start dismantling the systems. So these are the panels that were at the top. So above the three meter um, height, and you can see that there is no damage whatsoever to the spray foam on the backside of those panels. The panels themselves had no damage. Uh, so really what we're saying is, is above that three meter horizontal joint, there was really no frame spread, no damage, no real risks there. So from a flame spread, it's a good indication that we're, we're passing the requirements there. When we saw, this is the three meter high horizontal joint above the window opening. We could see some smut, uh, the soot here is kind of marking that there was some lapping and airflow bringing some of the particulate into that cavity, but no indication that in any way this, you know, this is the, the quote unquote mineral wool slab band that we created, right? So obviously there's, there's some airflow there but none of it created really any issues. And above the angle that was kind of retaining the back band shows no damage whatsoever. Uh, this is the three meter high joint above the opening. So you can see a difference between the panel that was directly above the opening and the panel that was past that three meter height. So we can see that the panel below 
has kind of buckled and that the heat of the fire was enough to melt the surface of the aluminum. Above, you can see some significant distortion in the metal panel, some of the buckling of the panel, but none of it led to any kind of melting of the panel above the three meter height. When we look at the panel immediately above the opening, you can see that you know, this panel itself has been breached. The panel has melted, exposing the mineral wool. You can see from the soot on the insulation that the fire was actually lapping up the mineral wool insulation. And you can see here that it's gonna melt it, the deflection header uh, completely off at the face of the mineral wool, but past the mineral wool, the, the extrusion doesn't show any significant signs of failure. The <clears throat> insulation remains intact. It hasn't been displaced, hasn't buckled, fallen off or anything. When we pulled off that insulation, uh, we saw no distortion in the metal back band. Uh, there was a little bit of indication that the adhesive, that was you know, the stick pins that are being held there, Stefan, I think you are lagging. Here we're kind of looking beyond towards the money. Okay. So do you see the metal back band with the six pins right now? Yes. Okay. So this is where I was saying that having removed the mineral wool insulation, there was no signs of buckling of the metal back band. Uh, the only sign we saw is a little bit of softening of the adhesive that held the, the back bands in place. So in this next picture, uh, if you can see this, this is again, a, a view of the backup wall. And so again, here, the mineral wool insulation uh, shows the signs of soot, but no real uh, problem. This is still my kind of, you know, my back pan here. So obviously at the joints, we're seeing more smoke, but no real damage. So this is the removal of the panel directly above the opening. And we're looking at the uh, spray foam on the inside. You can see some elements of soot here showing that uh, obviously with the joint in the spray foam between panels, we're, we're getting some airflow once you know the, the gasketing starts to fail with the heat exposure in the vertical mullion and the combustion of the thermal break but we see really no damage to the insulation. When we pull those panels and started to remove the insulation, you can see some singeing of the back of the insulation. It's still fully adhered. It, it, it took a hammer to get it off of the back band, but you can see that obviously the flames having broken through the metal panel were providing enough heat despite the mineral wool insulation to you know slightly singe the outer face of the spray foam insulation. Here we are looking at the vertical joint. So we've taken the panel that's to the left of the window opening. You can see here in the bottom right-hand corner, the panel that had been consumed by the fire directly above the opening. And you can see what was starting to happen here. The flames were propagating through the vertical joint had kind of started consuming the, the thermal break to a height of about 18 inches. And you start to see some buckling of the aluminum frame as the flames are chasing up this vertical cavity. You could see that it buckled enough that the flames were actually coming past at the joint in the spray foam insulation and kind of exposing the interior drywall layer that's installed over the fire test wall. The angles that were kind of connecting it were, were not damaged and showing any signs of uh, distortion. But obviously what was happening is that vertical flame spread was coming up here. We believe that if the spray foam had been continuous, it probably would have prevented this breakthrough. But with a joint in between, we saw that the flames were actually able to get into this cavity. When we look at the removal of this panel, 
you can see on the back side of what was happening here again this is where the flame came up vertically this is the slab bypass so the flames were able to come up this vertical channel in the horizontal sorry past the horizontal at the slab edge and make its way up this chase consuming the thermal break it reached about a height of about 18 inches above the top of slab. And you can see that at this level, it failed to ignite the spray foam, but there is significant singeing of the surface of the spray foam where the fire had actually kind of made its way in past the vertical emollient. So overall, kind of what happened in this test? The combustible elements, the, you know, on the exterior face, the aluminum of the panel kind of melted and fell off. But the heat this added to the window plume did not exceed the criteria. The fire spread was limited to the area receiving substantial heat from the window plume. Limited combustibles on the exterior of the window wall. The protective layers, the metal back band, the mineral wool, retained their integrity. There was no substantial damage there. And there was limited fire spread, even with the ignition of some of the combustibles in the vertical emollients. It was clear that the slab was also part of the protective element. So the use of that mineral to replicate the concrete slab edge, you know, show that that slab does create that break in the window wall system and helps in mitigating the risk. So the flame did not exceed the five meter height on this floor. So the five meter height is kind of over at this height and the flames never can really pass you know, on the vertical face past kind of that three meter opening. The heat flux at 3.5 meters, so measured you know, right here on the second layers of panels was approximately on, you know, averaging the three sensors, 27 kilowatts per meter square. That's below the 35 that's allowed. The flames that we notice at the vertical uh, mullions right above the opening, they extinguish within 35 minutes of the end of the test. So that was a pass. So this system actually shows conformance to the S134. Any questions before we can wrap it up with uh, a few points in terms of applications for the future and kind of limitations? So if you had, so you had flame on the spray foam at that vertical joint. Yes. Um, but I would have expected the spray foam to burn. The, the spray foam itself did not ignite. It was fire that was coming up from the test chamber, making its way up the vertical and exposing the spray foam to heat and to flame but not sufficient to ignite the foam itself. Okay, and then we had um, one question from Danny Sullivan. Um, do you think a true slab would perform differently? Concrete versus the mineral wool mock-up? I, I think the concrete would have performed better than the mineral wool because these, there would have been less potential for airflow with the, um, with the use of the slab edge. Um, and then uh, did the spray foam have uh, any thermal barrier applied? It wasn't coated in an intumescent or anything. It was just straight nope. spray foam. Straight spray foam, no intumescent barrier. Now we, you know, because in this application, uh, we don't fill the spray foam cavity and we're relying on the gypsum board on the interior of the steel stud to be our ignition barrier against exposing the foam for interior heat source. Mm -hmm. So we typically do not do a separate ignition barrier on the face of the foam. Cool. Uh, thanks for your questions, guys. I think that's all we have for now. Okay. So, you know, use of this assembly, right? So obviously we can use this on projects if the wall assembly matches the test of the sump. So this is a specific window wall manufacturer, a specific brand of spray foam. And of course, if you're using that manufacturer and you're using the specific spray foam, 
then you can rely on this as a basis to show compliance. If you're using a different manufacturer, either a different window wall system or a different spray foam, you could use this result as a basis to try to write an engineering judgment, um, but you couldn't use these results without that engineering judgment. Um, of course, engineering judgments may allow for these kind of minor modification in the Canadian context. Here in the US, it'd be a little more challenging whether you could find a fire protection engineer that would be willing to write an engineering judgments on the basis of the S134 results in comparison to the NFPA 285 criteria. Engineering judgments, of course, require demonstration of performance to the satisfaction of the authority having jurisdiction. So obviously, no matter what you think of this, you still have to convince the authority of having jurisdiction that this is a adequate engineering judgment. There's permit specific, you know, just because you've been able to get that authorization for one project, you know, doesn't mean that you can automatically use it for your next project, right? So from a future perspective, we've we've gone on to look at the certification process in terms of visit factories and things that could be done more. Ideally, in the end, would be to get a listing from an agency such as UL that shows this assembly. Uh, we've also gone on to do a separate round of testing using glass spandrels and showed similar successful performance under the S134 criteria. All of this here is is gained to kind of you know build up more information to provide more confidence to the authority having jurisdiction so as to be able to secure their approval. So that's the end of our presentation for today. Um, you know, I'll uh, take any questions that remain. In the uh, glass spandrel test, how did that, did the glazing also fail like the metal panel did or? Yes, um, the heat was enough to shatter the glass. The glass fell out, and and again the flames kind of breached the outer surface of the window wall. Were able to expose the interior of the spandrel cavity. The mineral wool that was installed uh, within the back pan kind of performed well. There was no distortion or damage to the insulation. The back pan uh, remained sealed. There was no distortion in the metal back pan. We had a little bit more fire spread on that vertical joint, but still not enough to ignite the spray foam. And so the question here, uh, if you're looking at it in the context of that NFPA 285, is if you happen to have had a sensor right at that vertical joint, it's a question of whether that would have exceeded the allowable temperature differential in FPA 285. Um, however, you have to keep in mind that if I had a continuous layer of spray foam, that, that fire would probably never breach the emollient. Um, and so a more kind of reasonable assumption is to say at the interface of the back pan and the spray foam was the temperature differential sufficiently low that you would pass the NFPA 285. The indications are that it would, but you know, we don't have that test data. Um, it, it would have cost more for us to put additional instrumentation in place and you know the Canadian developer wasn't prepared to pay for that. Um, I am not seeing any additional questions. Um, well, hopefully this uh, provides you a little bit of insight as you're kind of looking, especially on these new high rise tower under the 2018 version of the codes. And you're kind of thinking of how to kind of improve your spandrel panel thermal performance. You know, that kind of the spray foam is kind of an option to kind of potentially use, but you that if you go that route, you may be challenged to do an NFPA 285. There's good indications here that the likelihood is that test would be successful. Uh, but as I said, you know, until someone is willing to kind of pony up 
and do that result, uh, you know, the, the uh, actual performance remains uh, a, a, um, a matter for future debate. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording.